Hello and welcome to Walk in the Shadowlands podcast. Let me be your guide as we take a walk into the shadowy realms of the unexplained, the paranormal, of things that go bump in the night and haunt your dreams. Your hosts? I'm Mary Ann. And I would like to welcome you to our podcast. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, today, whatever time it is, wherever you are living in this beautiful world of ours. So sit back, relax, and let me be your guide as we walk into the Shadowlands together and discover what awaits us there. Ever since mankind has been on this planet, we've looked towards nature for healing for our mind, body and spirits. Every single culture on this planet has their wise women or men, their shamans, their tohunga, their sacred medicine people, be they male or female. And all of these healers and wise people have had an innate relationship with the herbs, plants, vines and trees that grow around them, with many of them being able to communicate with the plants themselves. The most publicised cases of these would be with those of the ayahuasca plant, how it is sun to, spoken to, Prez or karakia said over it before harvesting and before working with the plant. But can plants talk to us? Can they? Many, many experiments have been conducted by real scientific minds on being able to communicate with plants and to have them respond to us. It's common knowledge that speaking to your plants helps them grow. Even school children have done science experiments on how plants respond – to both kind words and negative ones, a simple Google search will unearth heaps of articles and videos on the subject. It's said that even Prince Charles is known to talk to his plants. Most gardeners talk to their plants as they plant them or tend to them. They have a love affair with their gardens, be they veggie or flower. Sometimes that's a love-hate relationship, but most avid gardeners are well aware they are working with and encouraging and nurturing the growth of living plants. There is also an excellent documentary available on YouTube called What Plants Talk About, which discusses the secret lives of plants and trees. Is it really any stretch of the imagination that plants are able to respond to us to understand the energies that we put out to them, is it? Many New Zealanders have at the very least heard of the gentleman who will be my guest for these next couple of episodes. This gentleman is regarded by some as a bit of a controversial figure, not least because of his views on how New Zealand was settled prior to the arrival of the Māori in their great waka or canoes. An internationally known author, speaker and documentary maker, Gary Cook is a leading writer on the special nature of the mystic realms that are to be found in New Zealand. He has devoted many years of searching and writing of the wonders to be found within the islands of New Zealand and the South Pacific. For many years, Gary Cook was a regular contributor to a now-defunct New Zealand magazine called Rainbow News, which was a spiritual sort of New Age type magazine that I used to devour eagerly, not because I believed in everything or even actually most of what was written in there but because some of the articles resonated deeply within me. It was from the magazine that I first learned about the still relatively little-known Kaimanawa Wall, deep in the middle of the Kaimanawa State Forest. Gary is a very deeply spiritual man, both in touch with himself and with all aspects of nature around us, and it is on the subject of nature that this show will delve into today. His extensive journeys and experiences allow him to share much of the deeper nature of the forest, the waters and the mountains that allows us all to connect with the natural order in a deeper and more meaningful way. The author, 
of three books in the Secret Land series and others, Gary is a regular contributor to Australian and New Zealand magazines, offering readers unique glimpses of the sacred landscapes of Aotearoa. He's a regularly requested speaker at conferences both here in New Zealand and overseas. He's also created a number of documentaries and DVD recordings of the songs of trees, plants and poenamu or greenstone and it is these that we will be touching on today and next week. Gary says, My journey into our past has taken me into the land in ways that have surprised me. I have touched the stone and the waters and in turn been touched by them. Trace the outline of ancient carved symbols with the tips of my fingers and been moved and been taken beyond the story to the spirit that is of this land, of its past, of its many people, yesteryear and now. Thus do the ancestors speak and thus are they honoured when we stand still and listen. Gary was with us a few weeks ago talking about his experiences and research into the Parapaarehe. We are very fortunate to have him back with us talking about his experiences, experiments and learning into the field of the music of the plants. To begin with, he'll take us on a bit of a journey to the last episode when he was on here with us answering a question one of the listeners sent in for him about the fairy folk or Padupaarehe. Then we'll go into some background about plants and trees and about plant blindness. What is that? Then in the next episode we'll talk specifically about the music of the plants. So this will be a leisurely stroll with a few details until we reach the heart of the subject. But it is a delightful leisurely stroll in the Shadowlands with Gary sharing his wisdom and experiences with us all. So let's walk with Gary into this part of the Shadowlands and see what awaits us there. Here is Gary Cook. Before we start, Gary, I've got a question for you from a member of my Facebook group of the same name as this podcast from the last time you were with us. Can you please ask Gary how I can make my garden fairy friendly? I don't really know how. Well, it's, that's an interesting question, actually, because I think anywhere, whether it's a um, wild garden or uh, a wild area or a planted garden, anywhere is inviting to um, the elementals and the fairy folk. Um, I guess that one thing uh, I suppose which comes to mind is that um, in gardens which have lots of flowers, which invite uh, bees and birds, you know, for nectar, and butterflies and things like this. And I often think that um, sometimes there can be a corner in the garden which at a certain time of the year or perhaps all year round has flowers and, and colour, and I think this is very, very inviting. But other than that, just walking around the garden and walking in forests and walking across fields, anywhere like that, that's where an awareness can take place. You sometimes be aware of the fact, well, there's something there, perhaps I can't see it. And as I, I may have mentioned in the um, our original chat, you, you don't always see what is there but you can certainly get a feeling of what is there and a knowing and you don't always have to see as much as the desire may be there and um, I guess too that it's how people interpret theories whether they look upon going right into the elemental realms which are the uh, elemental beings which look after all plants moving up to the fairies but uh, there are so many different types of fairies it's interesting, too, to actually pin down the fact that there are fairies with wings because in ancient literature and in medieval times, fairies did not have wings in a sense. Uh, fairies could certainly move through the sky, but that was usually <clears throat> at times of what they call the grand procession, which is where the king and the queen of that particular fairy realm and that particular fairy mound in the UK they were observed flying in a grand procession once or twice a year. 
But other than that, it would appear that winged fairies came into, um, in Victorian times and when spiritualist groups and things were taking a, a lot more notice of elementals and, and beings and other realms. And then, of course, um, Walt Disney, of course, actually uh, popularized winged fairies with Tinkerbell and things like that. So, but this is, of course, this is the fairy which intrigues little children. And right. the winged fairy is what they expect to see. And they may even, you know, see a fairy which is riding on the back of a bumblebee or riding on the back of a dragonfly. So there are all sorts of stories like that. But the stories that I've pursued uh, in New Zealand, of course, with the Patapairehi, and these are more like elven folk or gnomes or in that category where they are very human in, in stature, uh, well, much, much smaller, of course, and not, not as tall. So I find that often when I walk through the forest here at home, uh, I sort of have an experience. So suddenly I have a heightened awareness that there's something there. And I'll stop and I'll just um, say a word. Even though I can't see or can't hear anything, I'll say a word. So I think this is the thing to introduce yourself in your garden area. And it's not a matter of having anything uh, in particular planted out or any, but there just may be a place in the garden which is uh, comfortable for the fairy beings to appear and, and be there. So there's no, I don't think there's any um, rule of thumb here as far as it goes. But I always remember years and years ago when I first became aware of these realms, being told by an elderly lady from the Isle of um, Oh, stuck. Uh, yeah, one of the uh, islands where um, she was a sort of a fourth generation or fifth generation seer. And she had a wild area in her garden. She had a lot of garden, but there was a wild area which she just let grow wild and it didn't tend it at all. And she said, this is where they dwell in the wild area. That's interesting. So keep that in mind. Oh, that's a good response. I've actually heard that said about wild areas before in a garden, yeah. So that's quite nice to have that reconfirmed. Thank you, Gary. I'm sure that my group member will be very happy with that. That music that you just listened to was created by a piece of poinamu when Gary was first introducing his new equipment. He did not realise at the time that he was able to capture the energies put out by this wonderful stone. Poinamu, as it is known, is a New Zealand green stone and is considered a toonga, or treasure by the Māori, and many non-Māori as well. It is found only in the southwest of the South Island of New Zealand, known as the Peace Stone. Poinamu has a calming effect on people and has a great spiritual significance to the New Zealand Māori people. What started you on this journey with the plant music? Was it when you caught the sound of the Poinamu singing? No, 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 no. So you're, you're asking me then what got me started? Yeah. In, in interested in plants. Yes. I suppose that um, when I look back, as I said in the first talk that we had together, um, I mentioned um, in childhood being very interested in forests and trees and things. And 
that went right back, you know, to even when I was uh, five or six years of age and right up to uh, in my um, teenage years. Then, of course, family situations change and you drift away from the beautiful outdoor rural forest areas and into living in towns and cities. So always had an awareness uh, and always a, a great feeling of, of being you know, sort of at home and being restful. It's a bit like when any of us can, say, get away from our everyday work situation, uh, whether it's um, a day trip, a weekend trip, or whether it's the annual holidays, and, and we leave the environment in which we spend most of our year, and we go and we move within nature. And the tradition, of course, within New Zealand for so many years were was the summer holidays where everything closed down and everyone packed up and went away to the beach or to the lake or to the rivers and camped out. And this was a time when so many people had an incredible contact with nature. And, of course, being away for you know 10 to 14 days uh, in that environment was always uplifting to people. And... I guess that um, psychologically, uh, you could say that was just being away from the pressures of the work environment and everything else that goes on in the world, just enjoying family time, camping out or caravanning or staying at motels or just cruising around in your mobile home. That was great. But I always felt, though, that in doing this, not that I did this very often myself, my family wasn't into that, my uh, release was just being able to walk in a park etc. And I've always enjoyed just ambling or strolling. I'm not a, an intrepid tramper and I'm not one of these people who put on their headphones and run furiously through the forest doing their, their training, their running and things like that. I've always been fortunate to have lived in proximity to where there are trees and where there are parks. And I often say to folk too, Marianne, that um, even if you live uh, in the middle of a city and even if you're just on a small townhouse or you're living in an apartment building, there is always the opportunity to go and be with plants and trees. And I cite uh, cities like uh, Wellington, Christchurch and Auckland in New Zealand. And I know of other cities I've visited in other parts of the world. There's always parks and spaces where people can, can go and hang out or just walk or just sit quietly and feed the ducks in the duck pond. This has always been something which I, I, I think um, has been so beneficial to people to be able to just walk with the nature like that. So I guess for myself, I've always had the opportunities. And fortunately, in the, the years that I've been married and the fact that we moved around quite a bit, we always had, we were always in proximity of beaches, rivers and forests. They were just an easy, short drive away or sometimes just a walk down the end of the road and into a park. So these places are very, very important. And uh, even to plants within your own environment, and I say to folk, if you live in the middle of a city and you're living in a high-rise apartment, you can still have your plants. You can have your house plants. As I see a house plant over your uh, shoulder over there, Marianne, behind you. Oh, two cyclamens. I've had them for about three years and I absolutely love them. They provide me with colour in my apartment the whole year around. That's right. So we always have these. They not only uh, add colour, but there are a lot of plants, of course, which are beneficial uh, within a closed living space, which help to filter the air, which is uh, through photosynthesis, which is very important. And even to those, as I say, living in, in high-rise apartments, you can have a little few pots out on on your balcony, which uh, often people do, and they in the summer they'll grow a few tomatoes, uh, but they'll also grow you know herbs and things, uh, culinary herbs for the kitchen. So we can always have these contacts, even though we can't get out and and walk in it. We can always have the contacts, and it's um it's even therapeutic. Watching a YouTube clip of just walking in, in nature in the forest, it, it just allows you to escape and, uh, and, and go back uh, into places that you may have enjoyed with either when you're a child or in recent times when you're on holiday. So a bit of a ramble here, but um, I guess that um, we can always find a place to go to. Right. And even if it's uh, a bus ride or, or a car ride or on our bicycle if we're living uh, in an urban area, 
there's always a place that we can go to and walk around. And open space is uh, as good as forest space. Often we come across little parks within an urban area which uh, haven't been greatly uh, planted out in trees and maybe a few trees there. But often it's just a, an open space for grass, which they keep node, and they make a uh, playground there for, for children to play in. So these places are there, and I think we've got to grab that opportunity where we can. Uh, I remember years and years and years ago, and these are things which um, come to mind when I was, uh, as a younger person, working in Queen Street in Auckland in a shop there as a shop assistant. And one day walking down the footpath in, in the busy Queen Street, and I stopped on the side of the road there and I was just gazing around at buildings and things. I looked down at my feet and there, growing out of a crack in the curbing, was a plant which I took in those days perhaps to be a weed. I didn't know what sort of plant it was. And I looked at this little plant and I thought, oh my gosh, this is how nature prevails. Even in the, the, the busy, busiest place, places where there's lots of people, lots of traffic, Little plants will grow. Little plants are, and they're always there. Mm, mm. And so I thought, well, that's interesting. And that little plant is um, just as important as, as a big tree because little plants like that also actually um, go through the process of photosynthesis. Mm. And so bringing in the sunlight and they're synthesizing this and taking the carbons out of the air and in their own little way, with you know, sort of half a dozen or ten leaves, putting oxygen back for us to breathe. So these are things to, to note. And even if we are walking, you know, sort of down a street somewhere and we come across a little bank or even a stone wall, when we see moss growing there, gosh, you know, so we're surrounded constantly by a green nature. You know what I mean? So it's, it's always there. Yes, and that's a valid comment about the plant growing in cracks. And I've often seen like little, well, usually it's dandelion flowers, to be honest, or something like that coming up through the cracks. And I always admire the tenacity of nature and how plants always find a way to survive and thrive in the most hostile environments. That, that's exactly right. Hostile and also how um, plants, and particularly uh, I noticed down here, because we live on the edge of a, of a small forest, which is on our land and joins onto other forests. And we have a, a big gardens here, of course, and which my wife Raymond tends. And if we just leave things to go as they should, it doesn't take long before the seeds from the forest trees have dropped into the garden area, which we've been maintaining and cultivating. And little seedlings like Rewa Rewa and Manuka are popping up mm. uh, all over. So. It doesn't take long for, for nature to prevail. And I remember when we first came to this land uh, over 20 years ago, there had been a, a slippage down the track on the way to the river. And it was a very bare area of clay and uh, things like this would have slipped right down towards the river. And I thought, what on earth are we going to do with this? And it was a lot of gorse growing there. And I thought, wow, well, this could be the time for an experiment because I had read uh, prior to coming to this land that if you wanted to reforest in, in native trees and you had gorse, you use the gorse uh, to act as a nursery. And the, uh, this will then allow native trees and whatever you plant in there to come back, and particularly natives because it's their natural habitat. Right. So I just left the gorse there. I just left, I trimmed it around on the track, but I just let it grow right down this cutting. And there it grew tall and um, all these beautiful um, yellow blossoms. And then now when I go back down there after 20 years, I've got one or two straggly bits of gorse left. The native forest has come back in such a big way. Manuka, Kanuka, Rewa Rewa, young Rimu trees and all of this. So wow. nature always prevails. And it, it's worth knowing that um, the things like gorse, Instead of hacking it down, if, if you have the, the room to allow that space to sit for a number of years and you plant your natives out in there, they'll grow. And, of course, gorse requires a lot of light. And when the natives start, to, they're searching for the light anyhow. And they come up and they've got a higher canopy. And, of course, they deprive the gorse uh, of its light and it just dies back. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's 
Wow. Now, isn't there a name for that sort of agriculture? Isn't that bio, bio, oh gosh, I can't, th- just can't think of the name off the tip of my tongue when you just let nature do it, when you let nature just do its thing? Well, yeah, it's, it is, it is. I mean, that's a wonderful thing to do, but a lot of people don't, you know, sort of allow for that. At, um, as far as they're concerned, a native forest or native trees may may not be what they want, and they may take and um, which they have over years and years and years, and plant um, Pinus radiata. Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, incidentally, Pinus radiata, and of course this was a tree that they discovered uh, in the early 1930s in America. And in America, it comes from uh, California and it's called the Monterey pine. And the Pinus radiata, of course, is, um, is sort of slated in New Zealand as, as being the tree that we just grow very quickly and chop down and plant more, which we've seen happening all over the place. Right. But in America, where the Pinus radiata or Monterey pine comes from, it is a highly revered tree by the local Indian people and has such a high standing in their myths and legends and their everyday life. So I often say to people, you know, sort of don't underestimate Pinus radiata. I mean, on our land here, we have a couple of uh, wild pine trees, which have been growing probably for many, many years. And um, they could be... 40 to 50 years old, and they're going to grow probably until they're 80 or 90 or 100 years old. Wow. So these trees, which have been somewhere or another stolen in an area of land, I was not going to chop them out because they are trees, and this is where we've got to revere trees. And if we can work uh, with existing trees, uh, such as pine trees and anything else, um, wattle trees which have been planted for tree crops and all those sort of things, we're in a far, far better state to bring about a balance within nature. Mm. Anyhow, so that's the way I look at it. And I'd just like to you know, insert that about uh, Pinus radiata, or I now like to call it the Monterey pine. And um, it is a very, very special tree in its own way. And I have actually recorded music, which I'll talk about later, from the Monterey pine. And it's just a beautiful song. Sweet. And for me personally, I always find pine trees to be incredibly uplifting. The fragrance that their needles put out or that the tree itself puts out, I find always puts me in an uplifted space and it clears my energy. No, no, I think that's quite right too because uh, what the trees are doing, they're they're putting out, um, well, virtually the essence of the tree itself and it's like Mm -hmm. the perfume of the tree and this enters into our, our bodies, you know, through inhaling it and walking in it. And these things trigger various parts of um, activity in our brain, which uh, allows us to um, feel more relaxed and at ease. And this can happen in any forest, whether it's a pine forest or it's a uh, forest which is full of kauri or limu or just mixed native. It can happen anywhere. Anywhere there's uh, life growing like that. We can walk amongst those trees. I remember um, walking amongst the, the redwood plantations at um, Rotorua, which were quite vast. And they were put in place um, 90 to 100 years ago with the view of um, looking at a sustainable crop. But they're such magnificent trees and now uh, 80 to 90 years old. They're never going to be taken down for firewood or timber or for building or anything like that. They're just a joy to walk amongst. So here was an introduced species which is established so well and it's now providing so much for people who like to walk, run or ride through the forest. That's a really valid point because I know whenever I get the opportunity, I'll go for a walk in the bush. Soon as I get out of the car, as soon as I get out of the car and I'm in amongst the trees, it's just like poof, you know? You just feel a difference. You just feel, I immediately feel relaxed, immediately. As soon as I can smell that beautiful forest odour, it just grounds me right away and lifts me. Yeah. And it's also the same too. I mean, we've we've got something else we can compare that to. It's when we go to the beach Mm. and it's along the beach. Mm. And beaches that you've got down there in Hawke's Bay, you know, around the Napier area, of course, are all uh, shingle shingle beaches. Mm. Just walking on the beach, you're in the natural ozone, which is also beneficial to humans. So anywhere within nature that we can take the time. And even walking along the boardwalks uh, there in the main beach in Napier or around on the other side, around the shore, they're just ambling along. 
<clears throat> at the top of the beach there, there's so many little plants growing there, mm. you know, little succulents and things like this, which have incredible flowers in the season. And so there's a lot of plant life even around the beach. And also, I mean, just off the shore there, which we can't see, of course, there's all the plant life under the water. Right. Which is all the seaweeds and things of that nature. And likewise, um, in ponds and um, estuaries, down, uh, not far from where we live, we have the, the big uh, Tauranga Harbour, well uh, renowned for sea lettuce, you know, which washes ashore when storms come in. So there's so much growing also um, when we go to the beach under the water. And likewise, even when we go to um, rivers and we mm. stream, we're walking around and we come to a little pool of water which is not being disturbed too much by the water flow. And we look very closely and we see all these little organisms, plant organisms, growing on the rocks. So we're surrounded by plants. And an amazing thing, Marianne, is that um, in recent times with um, uh, neurobiology, which is a new uh, science which is studying the uh, intelligence of plants, they have come up with a figure which I find amazing. They say that 99% of all life in the biosphere of the planet, it's plant life. That's 99%. So there's wow. just 1% where we as humans, every other mammal, every other living creature, whether they fly or whether they crawl below the ground, we just fit into 1%. So we actually live on a plant planet. Wow. I think that's why the plant planet is conducive and always has been conducive to the other realms where the fairy folk and the elementals live. So everything goes hand in hand. Mm. You know, within the biosphere, I mean, it was just the complete, you know, sort of system that we live in. And, of course, now nowadays we hear a lot about how the system is being damaged and how it's um, we're not caring for it as humans. But hopefully that's all going to change as quickly as we can over the next few decades and bring it back to... Um, a better balance. Well, I don't think we have much of an option now, do you? I think we're actually, I think we're really at a major tipping point. But I feel that the positive thing about this is that so many people are awake now and are aware of things that are actually important to our continued survival, to the survival of all species, actually. Well, no, humans may die out, but plants will live on regardless. That's right. And, and also, uh, you know, for the survival of all species, of course, everything on the planet relies on plants. Not only do the plants provide us with the oxygen that we breathe, but they also filter the carbons out right. uh, of the air. So there's a two-way thing. We put out carbons, which feed the plants, which is, which is wonderful. Now, we as the animals, mammals, put out a lot of carbon. And, uh, of course, we've um, that's become a little excessive with uh, the modern industrial age that we live in, but that's something with, uh, for another day. So we're looking here at the fact that um, plants provide everything within the, the biosphere of the planet to sustain our lives. Not only is it because we are, we are a carbon body, we are a carbon being, we rely on the oxygen for breathing. Okay. Now, the plants then supply us with all our food. Everything that we eat has come from a plant source, even though there are those who will eat chickens and fish and, and meat, which have been, have been farmed. All these creatures that we consume, um, they have grown up and, and come into um, maturity by eating plants. And okay, so, and so have humans. So it's interesting that we just live on a plant planet. Mm, mm. That's it. You know, and when we suddenly start to think about this and realize it, it's like a little light bulb flashes on and think, oh, my God, of course you do. Why didn't I think about that 20 or 30 years ago? So, so many things we just take for granted. It's a bit like referring to <clears throat> plant blindness, and it's a very interesting um, experiment. It's often done by... Uh, Stefano, uh, Professor Stefano Mercurio, uh, who's a plant biologist um, at the University of Florence in Italy, 
And when he's starting to give a talk to people <clears throat> uh, on the rostrum there, he'll have a big picture on the screen behind him, and it'll be a picture of grass, uh, like a meadow with trees in the background. And he'll say to the people, well, what do you see here? And they're looking hard for what they can see. And they can't see anything. Then you put up the next slide, which is the same picture, but this time he's put a little herd of five or six deer in the foreground. And they say, now, what do you see? Oh, we can see the deer. Oh, look at the deer. Wow. And he puts on the first slide again. He said, now, look at this. Look at all those trees. Look at the grasses. Living things, living beings, and you didn't even see them. And this is what he calls plant blindness, where so many people take uh, trees and plants for granted. They're just in the background. Right. For some of the happiness, they're in the foreground of our life. But for a lot of people, they're just there. And, of course, for some people, uh, when they do see the tree, they look upon it as being uh, something which we can fell those trees and um, cut them up for firewood. We can fell those trees and we can build a house out of them. We can fell that tree because it's blocking our view. We can fell that tree because we want to um, uh, plant an orchard. So very little thought is actually given to that tree and uh, or to those trees. They're just there. So this is what they, they term plant blindness, taking things for granted. And if we do stop and think about it, it's, it changes your, your whole perception when you suddenly realise this. And I guess we're all guilty of it. I, I, I often say, as an example to folk, you head off to work in the morning and you go out the front door and you um, <clears throat> pat the dog on the head and say hello. And as you walk down the driveway towards the front of your house, the pathway, the cats there, and you say hello to the cat, and you're walking past all the bushes and the garden and some trees down the side of the driveway, and there's a bird singing up there, and you might notice a bird and glance up at the thrush. And you've acknowledged the animals. You've acknowledged the cat and the dog, and you've acknowledged the bird. But you have not. Most people haven't acknowledged the tree. Hmm. The tree is just there. Once again, it's, it's in the background. So that's one aspect of, of plant blindness. So I guess because we just, I mean, I'm looking out my window here and, of course, we're surrounded by trees and paddocks and or grass and gardens and, and long-distant views, and all I can see is trees. And um, I'm quite at peace living in a place like this, and it's just wonderful. There are those, of course, who did, just don't have that opportunity. But what I'm sharing with you today will hopefully open up people's to more opportunities for themselves to actually uh, not take trees and plants for granted. Mm. And case in point, where we do have indoor plants, we nurture them, we feed them, we water them, hopefully, and we love and admire them, and we'll talk to them too. And it's the same with um, intrepid gardeners, with vegetable gardeners, etc. When they're out in the garden <clears throat> planting the seeds or uh, tending um, the broccoli and uh, things as they grow, uh, they'll talk to the plants. And so this actually uh, is a jolly good idea because the plants can hear you. We'll go into that shortly. The plants can hear you. And they can respond, and they respond with music of the plants. In this episode, we've begun our journey with Gary. We started with Gary answering the question posed by a member of my Walking the Shadowlands Facebook group, and then we talked more about the wonderful world of plants and trees around us, about the energies and how they work together, and a bit with us. Join us next week as we continue and conclude this walk through the Shadowlands. The music at the very beginning of this episode was recorded from Gary's Tangelo tree. And it's a very interesting tune, and I actually quite like it. 
After Gary answered the question about the Patapaarehe, the music then was recorded by Gary and was created by the energies put out by a Poinamu stone. Gary created that recording as a small introductory presentation of the music of the stones with his then new electronic device, the MIDI Sprout. To me, it's an extraordinarily beautiful sound created by the Poinamu, showing that stones have and do give off energies or their own type of music for those who care to listen. To me, it is a very beautiful and almost haunting sort of sound. If you or if any of you have any questions or comments that you'd like to make, questions you might like to ask Gary, or experiences that you might like to share with myself and my audience, then please don't hesitate to email me at shadowlands at yahoo.com, or if you're a member of Anchor at Anchor FM, then you can leave me a voice message via their platform, which I could include in an upcoming episode. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a positive rating and a written review on your chosen podcasting platform. Who knows? You may hear your review read out at the end of one of these podcasts. And of course, so you don't miss out on our next episode, make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcasting platform. This podcast is available on all free podcasting platforms and soon to be available from iHeartRadio as well. If you don't have a smartphone, then you can listen to the episodes from the podcast website, www.walkingtheshadowlands.com. For those hearing impaired, there is a full written transcript of each episode on the website, so you don't miss out at all. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your workmates about our show, encourage them to listen and to subscribe also, the more the merrier. Also, please consider supporting this show on Patreon.com. You can check out the link on our website, check out our Facebook page, Walking the Shadowlands, and our Instagram feed of the same name, and our Twitter feed, at Shadowlands10. Like and follow for hints on our upcoming episodes. Thank you so much for listening. Tonight, today, wherever you are in this beautiful world of ours, we'll see you this time next week. Thanks for listening. 